Welcome to the show, everybody. This one was recorded April 28th. Fantastic episode. Return guest Herman Ponser, which if you go back to the before times and check out his episode from a year ago, May 20th, May 9th, 2019, uh, that's a fantastic episode as well. But the reason why um, this one took months to get out is because I recorded a ton early on in quarantine. Uh, was super excited to get new video episodes out and all of the editing and improving of video quality and everything else to get this up to the standard that I want so that it doesn't just look like another Zoom call or something for you guys uh, has taken a while and we've been including things like brand new animation of the theme song so cool animator megan armstrong uh made this for the show continuing to make little tweaks and improvements and learn so much all the time like the highlights bite-sized science that are brand new since quarantine too and at the end of the show i'm gonna tell you a bunch of cool things uh, that I got lined up going forward and how there's going to be a lot more um, viewers uh, coming real soon as we're just about to start. Uh, we almost have things how we want them and just about to start making a, a, a big push um, to uh, spread the word about the show. So thanks, you here we are hipsters for being in on the ground floor and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm having a uh, return guest. Herman Ponser is joining me. He is uh, one of my favorite guests that I've had on both both the, the podcast and Stand Up Science. Um, really uh, one, of, one of the most fan, uh, fantastic guests on both. So thanks for coming back and doing this remote uh, <laughs> Podcast. Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I wish it was under better, different circumstances, but what can you do? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting that once I once I let go of um, you know not being able to record in person, it is nice mm -hmm. that I can connect with anyone that I want to in the in the country at at any time, and so. There's pros and cons to doing this yeah, remotely. Yeah, I'd but. say this, that kind of just dawned on, uh, on us and my, my lab group. Um, we lost all the, you know, we have, Duke has these wonderful speakers who come through campus and, and share what they're working on. And you kind of get lazy and you're used to like, well, you know, every Friday or every other Friday, whatever it is, you know, you just sort of go to lunch and, and there's a speaker and you don't have to dial anybody in or do the work yourself unless you're on the committee, the unfortunate mm -hmm. souls on the committee who have to invite the speakers. Yeah. Um, but then I was thinking, gosh, we lost that connection, but we could just zoom anybody in. I mean, yeah. That's kind of amazing, actually, right? Like people who you would never be able to fly from Japan or, you know, or, or Africa or something like that. You know, a, a collaborator we'd love to have, you know, those lab meetings could never justify all the expense and time. But now, actually, why not? Yeah. I guess we could have done that before, too. So it's kind of... Um, it's one of those embarrassing realizations, like we could have been doing this all along. <laughs> yeah, so it's a real punctuated equilibrium in the in the evolution of our of our uh, our culture, um, yeah. and and the way in which we communicate with one another. Um, yeah. I, I uh, uh, so first off, why don't we get a little bit of your background um, for for people that didn't hear you the first time around? Um, tell the folks what you do. Sure. I'm a professor at Duke University, and my research focuses on human evolution sort of broadly. And specifically, I'm very interested in understanding how our bodies have evolved to sort of take the energy in that we get in when we eat and, and divide that energy up, allocated to different tasks, growth, mm -hmm. reproduction, activity, that kind of thing. Kind of watching our energy economy at work, because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's sort of where the gears all mesh together in terms of physiology and ecology and, and evolution, um, you know, your bo our bodies are all calibrated and tuned over evolutionary time um, to, to be very good at a, spe a specific lifestyle that allows us to bring energy in and, you know, and, and reproduce and, and be good evolutionary uh, agents. And so um, I'm interested in how humans have evolved to do that, how, what our particular strategy is. And so that means um, I measure energy expenditure a lot. 
And we do that, my lab and I and my collaborators and I do that in different populations around the globe, different human populations. So I've worked with hunter-gatherers and pastoralists uh, and, and collaborated with people you know, all over the planet. Um, and we also do it across species because we want to put humans in context of, you know, in an evolutionary context, it's sort of an evolutionary framework. We need to know what the other members of our family tree look like. So we've worked with apes and uh, other primates in, in zoos and sanctuaries and that kind of thing. Um, so one, how long is it going to take before the human body evolves to adjust to our new position in front of laptops? Actually, by that time, we'll have the contact lenses and everything, and it'll be, maybe we'll live inside the computers by that time. Any for the, for the amount of time that it would take our bodies to evolve and adapt, I don't think that we'll be in front of laptops anymore. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, the thing is, like, the way that it would have to work, it's fun to think about these evolutionary scenarios, right? Because uh, people say, well, how long until we adapt to that? And you have to think, well, the way things adapt uh, is d- b- births and deaths, right? So <laughs> yeah. it would have to, you'd have to have the ones, people who aren't good at being in front of the screen die off or not be able to have kids. And those who are really good at being in front of a screen have more kids. And you think, well, what would actually make it, you know, we, we'd be better? Making those connections is fun, right? Like maybe... Um, it'll be like in a, you know, in a Tinder grinder zoom world, you know, and all this mate connection that we make, uh, yeah. maybe people who are like have a face made for zoom, you know, like and the sexual selection takes off. Well, of you know, actually have to, to, you know, violate social distancing and, and, um, <laughs> and actually have sex with the person that that's that's required but or, well, that. uh, or you mail your genetic. Yeah, yeah that's true. I mean, and- the post, you know, Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, Don't try it at home, man. But I suppose <laughs> anything's possible. I, um, it, you don't happen to know Todd Shackelford, do you? No, that name doesn't ring a bell. I he, probably should he, know Todd. He's a What's sperm competition guy. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, he sure. just has sperm being mailed to him all of the time from just all over the place for a variety that, of it reasons. Sounds like a bad, campy movie. <laughs> um, my favorite sperm competition fact, human evolution fun fact, is that um, the – so. We have two, uh, you know, our two closest relatives, well, so, sorry, three. So, our, you know, our closest relatives are the chimpanzees and bonobos in terms of living evolutionary relatives to humans. Mm. And then just outside of that is, um, is gorillas. And so gorillas are these big, beastly, you know, silverback gorillas, like no joke. It'll, it'll rip your head off happily. Um, they weigh 400 pounds. And, you know, they're these big, manly-looking things. But they live, they've evolved to live in these societies where um, there's no, uh, the the male male competition that happens is all physical competition that happens before the group gets set up. But once this group is established, the group is, the typical group is a male, a big silverback male, and a few females. He's not competing. There's no, uh, there's basically very little, uh, you know, copulation that's happening outside of that group. And so there's no sperm competition there. Right, like he right. basically has dom- he has he has um, monopolized access to all those females, and so their balls are tiny, right? So and these and on the gorillas. inside, right? Are, aren't they on the inside? Uh, no, I or think maybe they they're hang, but uh, they their, hang. their balls are tiny. Yeah, and, and, and chimps. I know the chimp balls balls hang are, yeah. are external. Um, chimps have this much more sort of free flowing. Uh, that's a, a weird metaphor to use there, but weird expression, but a, a freely, there's a lot more uh, copulation that happens outside of, you know, just the, the head male, the alpha male. And so now yeah. there is sperm competition. And so uh, you put the, the balls of a chimpanzee together, they're as big as its brain. Yeah. I, <laughs> I could. <laughs> Humans are somewhere in the middle, if you're wondering. <laughs> they're as big as its brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's wow. A, it's it's I a mean, shockingly a lot, you know, you think about it, So, you know, I think about investment, I, like I, a species that has limited resources has to invest. I, God, that's a, that's a huge investment in your balls, man. Yeah, yeah. I, worth it. And for them, <laughs> surely. Yeah. I get, it. I get it. I wonder how much uh, selection pressure there was of just like, because there are the, these variety of other factors of, of like, um, uh, you, you know, once once testicles get so large and ridiculous, how much does that, how much does playing with them uh, help with anxiety? <laughs> and then, then lower, 
<laughs> there well, really, this classic te- thing testicles are the most ridiculous thing in in all of evolution they're yeah. just the the silliest they shouldn't i mean if it weren't for sperm competition they don't really yeah. make that much sense and then that they're like so finicky too like <laughs> oh i gotta be on the outside i need the temperature just right but then it's yeah. also going to be the most fragile part of the body just everything about testicles is so absurd yeah, I, I totally, I agree. The, um, there's this great thing that chimpanzees do, uh, male chimpanzees do when they're about to like go on a border patrol or one of these sort of dangerous <laughs> things to just sort of cement their, uh, they, these, these, um, friendships, you know, to sort of say, yeah, we're all together and they cup each other's testicles yeah. before they go off. You know yeah. all about that. I, I'm sure. I, I but uh, it, that's yeah. just like, so, you know, it, sometimes, you know, you're like, wow, I really am looking at the mirror. Here. This is uh, shining an, an unwelcome light on human existence. Oh, well. I, I, I think that um, um, I think that they did some theory of mind study with like um, rhesus monkeys or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and and, um, and like did a mirror test to see if it would recognize itself in a mirror, put like a dot on it or whatever. Uh, on its forehead and and thought that its brain would be too small to recognize itself in the mirror. So they gave it a mirror and it recognized itself within seconds. And then its Mm. second move was it took the mirror and looked at at its testicles (laughs) within within like 10 seconds of the discovery of the mirror. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's something that's primal, are, you know, that's are, deep. Are we, like, as a dude, you have to know, like, we all have that aspect of who we are, and you have to have, like, some aspect that has to go, like, should we really be in charge of things? You know, <laughs> when you think about how much time, listen, I'm not yeah. saying ladies are perfect either. But if you yeah. just think about how much time, yeah, guys yeah, it's, it's a shocking thing about their testicles. How can yeah. you put that same thing in charge and they do it in front of it? it, it well, I mean, wh- who's actually in charge and who looks in charge? You know, no, that's, that's, that's yeah, a, that's, that's a, a whole different, separate set. Of that's a whole another it? thing. But yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so. So do you think that maybe um, as as we're all zooming, if this is our if this is our new world, maybe those guys, you know, those bodybuilders that like don't do their legs and they like look really <laughs> peculiar. Now that now it doesn't matter. We don't need to do yeah. leg workouts anymore. Yeah, I mean, you or we all mean- upper body. That's right. I'm just waiting for somebody to call and tell me I have to put on pants. You know? But it hasn't happened, so we're good. Well, and then uh, ladies no longer, they, they like, why shave and do all of the other things, no. but still, like, get all the, put all the energy into doing all this stuff still. And then it'll be, like, a real sexy, like, centaur kind of situation, like a goat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so there's this whole legs. body of evolutionary theory that worries about honest signals, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, why yeah. do the peacocks have the big feathers? Well, because it's an honest signal. You can't grow that huge big tail unless you're like such a, a badass peacock that you can yeah. deal with it. Like drag it around, it's heavy and annoying and, you know, it costs you whatever time and energy. And it, and, but you're, you do it because it shows just how tough you are or whatever, like a, um, the, we have great cardinals in my yard and, and these cardinals come in. The males are so bright red as apparently it's, you know, this the, the suggest, suggested that they're the, how bright red they are tells you how good they, how clean they are from parasites. So it's like an honest indicator of how you know healthy they are. Yeah. Um, and we are like quickly uh, for, for a species that has no, you know, problem lying to itself and to others. Uh, we're in a very interesting position now. We're like, the honest signal is dead. We're yeah. all this Zoom signaling now, you know? Yeah. Pretty soon I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this so you can't tell I don't have any hair, right? I'm going to get yeah. like the right angle on me, and it'll just be all just total bullshit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> I mean, it is. Cra- and, then, and then the way like self-deception takes a hold of us too. Yeah. You can like, 
prescribe drinking bleach one day and then say you're being sarcastic the next and then people yeah. and then some people will be like well okay i guess you was being sarcastic and then maybe you even believe yourself that you are being sarcastic oh if, yeah no, if, uh, the favorite whiplash moment i just had with that whole thing was um i uh i have a lot of extended family on facebook and i'm from rural pennsylvania so this yeah i'm from country. rural wisconsin yeah, and so um, I when he when when Trump says something that is completely uh, ridiculous, like maybe we should start drinking bleach uh, or somehow get the sunlight inside our body, which you know I thought that, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that one. That's also ridiculous, by the way. Yeah. But okay, so <laughs> um, and uh, it was yeah. I you know I'm like I got to go to Facebook and find out what people who who like this guy are saying uh, yeah. and they were so quick, you know, well, he was talking about disinfectant. And if you think about it, you know, antibiotics are disinfectants and that's all. And like, and then, and then 24 hours later, he like pulled the rug out from under them by saying, Oh no, I was just kidding. No, no, that was, it was totally ridiculous what I said. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean it. You know, <laughs> which I'm not even just, sure he came up with that idea. I think that might have been like someone's take on like Fox News or something like that. That then he saw, <laughs> and then he was like, "Is that? Oh, was I being sarcastic?" And then like, <laughs> <laughs> clearly yeah. I was being sarcastic. Yeah, I mean the yeah. human mind is oh. so. I mean, it's impressive. It's like. Like, I don't know if that's genius or stupid or both at the same time. And the de yeah. uh, the ability to deceive others, to deceive ourselves, to be a wash. And I mean, Trump's not the first example of deception that's uh, that's that's come across the human condition. No, it's course. just a real obvious one that we got to look at on TV every day when when shit's yeah. getting real serious and it's a little more troubling than. Than, than the usual. <laughs> Absolutely. So. The um, I'm reading a great book right now. Uh, I'm I'm trying to use this time to just to do some reading that I should have done before. And there's a there's a nice book, and I'd recommend it to anybody listening. Called the Good Book of Human Nature, mm -hmm. and it's uh, two. It's an evolutionary biologist and a historian, uh, Carl Van Schaik, who is a, a colleague of mine who I know he's at University of Zurich. He's been done. had a long career doing really cool behavioral ecology stuff with primates. And he took a kind of behavioral, primatological, evolutionary view at the Bible. Yeah. Like all the stories of the Bible. And, um, and he, he, did, he worked with this historian, Michelle. I forget what Michelle's first name is. Anyway, uh, and he talked about how, like, when you read all these biblical stories, it's neat because, you know, they, I don't know how many people would take this as, as a, an accurate read of the Bible. I'm not a Bible historian, but their take on it is the Bible is all these stories about. How do you go from being a hunter-gatherer to being a sedentary person with all of the, the problems that sedentary life brings with it, right? Disease that you can spread to one another, being sedentary all the time, wealth that can collect in, in you know, over generations because hunter-gatherers don't have that kind of wealth that you can accumulate and have inequality. Right. Um, how do you handle all those things and make rules about that that, you know, that, that makes sense? And one thing they come back to again and again is this, I, you know, this sort of reality that this realization that, that humans are so good at finding a coherent story in any set of completely ridiculous facts. Yeah. Right. So like, you know, you go out one day and, you know, you planted your plants a little bit different or you got a little too close to your neighbor's field. And that, that night, you know, Aunt Rosie got sick and died. And you're like, those are completely unconnected things. But you're like, you see what happened, you know, you start to make connections or the flood comes. You're like, well, you know what? The flood came, yeah, the flood came yeah. because, because Joe's an asshole, you know, like there's always some reason, like I knew those kids would get us into trouble someday. And now look, there's a flood, you know, it's like, uh, but there's always these connections that our, our brain just, just want to make. And the idea is, uh, that if you live in a world that could possibly want to kill you and that you need to figure out how to make a living in as a hunter gatherer, that storytelling ability actually really helps you because if you see the bushes rustle, you want to tell a story about why that's happening. Maybe that's a predator about to eat you, or maybe mm. that's, you know, an antelope that you could go, sh whatever, who knows? Um, it, it might be an opportunity. And so mm. if it's just, if the disconnected facts really just stay disconnected, that's actually not so useful. So it's better to, to tell stories that are meaningless, which we're very good at doing. 
Because mm-hmm. um, every now and then, it pays off. Yeah. I just I, think that's a kind of a beautiful way to think about our propensities to tell ourselves stories of all kinds. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's this, uh, this, I mean, the, the ability to recognize a pattern is so adaptive that it just, it's one of those traits that then goes a little overboard sometimes. I, I mean, I think that it's my understanding that you can do a similar thing with like, um, say a pigeon where you, you teach it, it does it, it does a thing. It hits, it hits some lever in some way and it gets some reward and and you teach it to, to, you know, the kind of just this Pavlovian yeah. conditioning and, and, um, and, and you, you teach it that the environment that it lives in is this predictable, like kind mm-hmm. of logic based environment where there's like a very clear pattern and then, um, and then, and it's easy to train. And then one day you just throw a random, uh reward in there and then it just goes wait what was i just what was i just <laughs> doing there and if, if it was like wagging its wing around it's, it's like it's like almost superstitiously uh, yeah. like that's its lucky move that gets it the <laughs> the, the reward i wonder how much yeah. superstition evolved um or or if people became more or less superstition uh, superstitious as we kind of gained domain over our, our, our environment or a, a little mm. more control over having like more predictable sources of, of food and, and whatnot. If you, um, it, if, if you start to see these more predictable patterns everywhere, if you then start projecting more patterns on everything, I don't know. It seems like there's no shortage of superstition within hunter gatherer tribes no they they, they're fine they they have all kinds of uh stories they tell themselves about you know (laughs) what's appropriate you know that a bird will fly through camp and if you know there are some species of birds that are good luck and some species of birds that are bad luck you know if the wrong bird flies through camp at nine in the morning ah you know it's like wow why did i even get up today like what's the (laughs) point you know And maybe they maybe they are tuned into uh, you know a pa- a pattern that well, exists for like yeah, that that like that bird picked up on a vulture and this other area that picked up on this thing that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I was in a I mean you never know right and, that, um, that they that they themselves like aren't aware of um, yeah no it, I, I no it, totally yeah. like the story actually does pay off because somehow there's a connection there. Um, like yeah, I get, I'm just remembering times of being in hunter gatherer camps and being told stuff that like was, I mean, by my reckoning, was pretty ridiculous, you yeah. know. But made sense to them, and like you know, who was I to argue? And and uh, yeah, I, funny I, stuff. I mean, my well, my what I think is, um, and I would love to hear your take on this because I'm sure you'll completely disagree with me. But one of what one of my favorite. Um, uh, or or kind of most efficient mammals on earth, I feel like, is the sloth. Just like, <laughs> the sloth's kind of my spirit animal, and I just can't believe, like, as cutthroat as evolution is, that it didn't, that something was just like, what if I just, like, don't move? Yeah. Hardly ever. And it's amazing, but they go they go all the way down um, I had a sloth person on talking about how they, they go all the way down like one tree mm-hmm. to poop. Um, and it's like this little bit of a mystery of why they do that because they don't move unnecessarily otherwise. And right. why aren't you just pooping from where you're hanging from? And it seems like there's, uh, it seems like there's some sort of uh, a, a benefit of you go down and, and these these eggs and uh, like different moths and things lay their eggs um, in the dung, and then and then those things end up jumping on the sloth, and the sloth otherwise has like algae and whatnot that's overgrowing yeah. on it if they aren't keeping it in check. So it's the symbiotic relationship. So <laughs> I, I I guess the sloth that stumbled upon a preference for for like going all right. the way down a, a tree benefited from from this or whatever but if you were if you were um a like uh, to to just fully anthropomorphize and and take some liberties here if you mm-hmm. were um a sloth that was like like uh, that kind of 
one day was like, wait, why are we, why are we going all the way down? It seems like such a waste of energy. I'm sure yeah. all the other sloths would be like, well, we do it because that's the way we've always done it. And it's, that's the good luck tree. And that's what, and, and, and so like the, the actual action that they're taking is correct and beneficial, but the stories that they're telling themselves about why they do the action is yeah. incorrect and just kind of grasping at straws. And that's... No, yeah, I hear you. I mean, I think that's probably right. The um, I don't know what, what sloths think about, uh, but it is fun. <laughs> you know, there's this. What, what's I'm, I'm blanking on. There's this. You know, this this very astute principle of of uh, kind of fits into conservative philosophy, which you know is, but it's this idea that if you don't know what something's for, you're not allowed to get rid of it. Right. If you oh, don't know what something's for, you're not allowed to get rid of it. And it's had the story is you know there's some gate some big ugly gate at the edge of the city and they say, well, we're going to get rid of that gate because it's been here for a thousand years and nobody even knows it does. So just get rid of it. <laughs> you know, and they take it down and then the Mongol hordes come and get something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the answer is, well, the gate was the reason you don't know what it's doing because it's doing it. You yeah. Idiot, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, as, as a contrarian, cynical skeptic who spent my whole life like raging against every cultural norm and tradition and like what the fuck are you guys talking right. about noah's ark and all of this stuff i'll tell you there there are some very heavy costs to just going against the grain all of the time and then after yeah. after a while you go like oh oh i guess uh, i guess there is like you know the the i i remember going to like crossfit just to alienate, I, I love alienating some of my listeners from time to time. So sorry, guys. but I remember, I remember <laughs> going to CrossFit originally and thinking that like some of these, some of these folks are like not the types that I would want to try to like have a big, deep intellectual conversation with, and um, and then, but then I was like, but damn, like. A person's got like a nice car and home and family and has a stable job and and is healthy and it's mm -hmm. like and just from doing like all of the things that society said to do and just kind of like mindlessly following those things not that they're not that they're not thinking for themselves and, and not, not that they're uh, not that i'm any smarter than that but but just the idea of of uh, um it it, it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't take that much cognitive effort to just follow along with some of the patterns that society has built that that can be really beneficial. And, but then there's the other side of the like, wait, we're all a bunch of smiling lemmings about to <laughs> <laughs> about to walk off of a cliff that uh, you see that, too. In yeah. Populations. No, I mean, you know, we have this we're like cursed uh, with being this weird cultural animal you know we're the only one so we don't even have anybody we can talk to you know if it was like if it was fifty thousand years ago we could talk to neanderthals and be like look man do you ever notice like sometimes you're just you're just following the norms for no reason <laughs> you ever feel like sometimes you know we, <laughs> yeah. we can't have that conversation you know like we're yeah. just, just ourselves um and uh but you know we need we, like we live in such a rich cultural world like you couldn't possibly learn everything you're just it's not possible you know like um, you can't learn how to make a house and make your own clothes and what you're allowed to eat and like how to keep yourself and like who you might want to have kids with or not. Like, you know, yeah, so all these things, like you just sort of absorb them and you don't even know you're absorbing them. And then about time you become like 16, 17, 18. And this is interesting. I wonder if this is like adaptive or just like a weird cultural burp that we have because of the way that our culture works. Like, is it inevitable that adolescents go through this asshole phase where they question everything? And, you know, and that's why college is so uh, rewarding to be in, but obnoxious to have to listen to. If you like hear people having these like deep, well, what, you know, why do I even wear shoes, man? You know, and it's like, well, because <laughs> it it's better. Just wear shoes. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, <kind> of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why do I even have to, you know, so um but like that's good it's good because you want to have this like the churn you know you want to have the questioning yeah but there has to be like it's it's just the yin and yang man it's it's the it's the balance and i don't know 
you know, we all, we all laugh at the people who don't have our particular balance. Like, oh, you're an unquestioning uh, Yeah, slob. yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Or like, dude, you know, just, what do you do? Like, why are you just living this crazy lifestyle? Why but I'm... So, I, I can I can carry on an intellectual conversation, I guess, just fine. But God damn, if I know how to like clean my room or pay off my credit card <laughs> right. debt or keep a stable relationship or like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, I, uh, I, I, uh, yeah. Some of this is is just. Yeah, when you talk about just the number of decisions that humans need need to make in life and what what is it the um kind of um uh, is it the i want to say accessib- accessibility heuristic or whatever where, where you just like simplify things like this is why there's like that new car smell um i think i think uh kahneman talked about this of of, of being like you go to you go to get a car there's a mm-hmm. zillion things you got to figure out you're not a yeah. mechanic. Yeah, okay, you don't have a description to whatever car magazine. You maybe looked on Consumer Reporter or whatever, but no, like, what? okay, what's the car? Do I need a V6 or V4? And how, how much is <laughs> yeah. the mileage? And, and then they display the mileage incorrectly, uh, too. It should be, it should be <laughs> gallons per thousand miles. It, it, it's a yeah, confusing yeah. experience, Prob- probably meant to be a confusing experience but uh, or at least rather that's a design that was stumbled upon that's probably been beneficial for car dealers um yeah. but but um anyway and then at the end of the day you just go oh it smells good and and, <laughs> and and then you tell yourself a conscious story of like well i made a very smart decision of this and that and yeah. and and uh and i i think this applies to um you know people hoarding toilet paper, which I think from a outsider point of view, I'm not Mm -hmm. crazy and like being like, wait, do we need, was that the first thing? Like more than food, (laughs) more than food, toilet paper. I also just wondered, have these people ever had the flu before? (laughs) I mean, of all the things I'd ever wanted during the flu, it wasn't like, oh God, you know, it's not dysentery. It's not a, it's not a cholera outbreak. I didn't understand what was going on with that. It but. was, and, but you know, it's, and, and I had some marketing people, you know, we talked about these like laws of scarcity and things, mm-hmm. things look uh, uh, like they're in demand and, and everything. And like, oh, I better get this before it's got, like, I, I feel I've said this a, a couple times on here that I feel like I could just go around the town that I'm in and go to like um, the grocery stores and staples and stuff and just buy out every pencil that everyone has in town. And it would be on the news like, Oh, we're out of pencils. Is everyone hoarding? <laughs> it would like take off nationwide and everyone would be collecting pencils. And, yeah. uh, but, but I mean, part of that is it seems really stupid on the surface, but another part of that is like, we have such a benefit of being social creatures and taking, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of copying that is very beneficial and not having to figure out every damn thing yourself. And mm-hmm. so you go, oh, yeah, are we, I, are we running out of toilet paper? I didn't see a news story about, <laughs> yeah. about us running out of toilet paper, but maybe we are. Shit, well, if, if everyone else is doing this, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yep. Absolutely. It's like social, like, and it's strangely sensitive, like you said, to scarcity. It makes me wonder if like, you know, the fact that we sell toilet paper in such a big, like you can't buy one roll anymore. Maybe like in a New York bodega. Yeah. But you can't, there's no such thing as one roll of toilet paper. Yeah. You have to, you have, you are required to buy, you know, br- bales, <laughs> bales of, of- back up like a, you know, this. And so they can only put so many on the shelves because the shelves are not built for this. And so yeah. if two people take them off the shelves, it looks like, you know, it's, I don't know. That's just yeah, a, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you um, seen the, this is besides the point, but have you seen the gigantic toilet paper rolls? Oh, the never ending roll. I have. I don't know who that's for. I'm I sorry, don't know who it's that's for either. I'm sorry. But I was at someone's house and they had one and I was just like, huh. It was, and you know who yeah. it's for is, is people that want um, conversation pieces. In in their house, in the and just like in the bathroom, like yeah. someone, like like <laughs> I think you get that, 
and then you have guests over, and then they go to use the bathroom, and then and then you just sit like, oh, we get to talk about <laughs> wait till they come out. Yeah, we get to talk about this. Now. Yeah. Um, all know, right. Yes, sir. No. What were you gonna say? Oh, I'm just gonna say I was gonna say you know it's it just made me feel wistful for the days when we used to have people over. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that was a sad joke, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. You, you you can no longer tell the guy walks into a bar jokes. <laughs> yeah, right. The guy walks into a bar and is immediately arrested. That's how that joke goes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um uh, I was uh I was curious when you were talking about um the honest uh the, the, uh yeah the honest signaling. Do people still do um, evolutionary thinkers still talk about um, um, like the handicap principle, or is that just now mm. called like honest signaling? It, what, it was Zahari or whatever the, Zahari, the, the yeah the, the uh, idea of intentionally kind of putting hurdles in your path to advertise your ability to jump over them. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's right. Um, I think that that school of thought has been kind of, you know, subsumed by the honest signaling stuff mm -hmm. and that the long, beautiful tales is true. They do slow you down. So it is kind of, it is, you are handicapping yourself, but mm -hmm. more it's the ability to grow that beautiful tale that says that you're, you have high quality genes is, is the mm -hmm. idea. The thing is all these, you know, talk about like, we can always tell stories that is such a, on one hand, it's a wonderful thing in science that we are so good at telling stories because you find, you know, the brilliant, Einstein's and the people who come up with these amazing ideas are the ones who saw three equations that none of us could understand and went, I see what's going on here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. To be able to put that together is like, that's, an, that's the mind of a great scientist. That's also the mind of like the conspiracy theorist, ver, you know, slash person who got their epidemiology degree on Twitter, who's like, you know, we just got 5G in my neighborhood and we're in social isolation. At I see what's going time, on here. Yeah. You know? so, so, like, it, like, uh, it, it's interesting what, like, because I, because I do think a lot of conspiracy theorists are probably like s above average IQ, or uh, I, I think that there's several that are above average IQ with no formal education of just like missing little things like yeah. correlation and causation. <laughs> there's, like, there's like a really yeah. important aspect. Like once you understand that, you learn to look at things very, very differently. And without that yeah. little bit of knowledge, you can be as smart as you want to, but you're going to make some horrendous mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like we have these ideas like the madman, the, 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 sorry, the handicap principle. I said madman because the guy is a hobby. He was called the mad, he was, uh, he had a nickname, the madman. Now I'm trying to remember why that was. Maybe he was. Maybe he was mad. Uh, yeah. But there was this idea, you know, for every phenomenon that we have in the natural world, there's like, there are, are no shortage of theories, of stories about, you know, why it happens. And so um, I just, it, it's always the, the mark of either bad science journalism or someone who just doesn't do a lot of science who doesn't really have a handle on things yet. Whenever they think that like, oh, you know, we need to explain this. You know, I, I work in human evolution. So I regularly get, usually unsolicited, uh, emails or advice or whatever at a public talk. Do you know what I think is going on with human evolution? Do you know what I think made humans evolve the way they did? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's always like, oh, God, this is going to be good. And it's always like, clams! Or, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> or like, you know, we, we didn't want to have sweaty feet. So, like, we've got, you know, whatever, like some, some ridiculous stuff. That's uh, and you think, wow, okay. And, and it, to them, they think that like the reason we haven't figured out human evolution yet, although we kind of have, but whatever, like the reason that we still wonder about it is because nobody's come up with a good idea. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, we have, we're, we're all full of ideas, man. Thank you. We're actually <laughs> yeah, we're good yeah. on ideas. What we're not great on yet is like ways to test and differentiate this other idea. So yeah. by suggesting more ideas, you're not actually helping. You're welcome yeah. to do it. But you're not actually helping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I have uh, one. Um, 
Sweaty feet, bad for survival, makes you slip. Also bad for sexual selection, makes your feet stink more. That's going to mm. put, put off mates. So I think they might be onto something with the, with the sweaty, <laughs> sweaty feet Fair thing. Enough. Fair <laughs> but, enough. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I do. Um, one, as a comedian, I, I, I get to indulge in wild speculation and just, and just so stories more than your average scientist. And I will say that it is quite fun to do. And, and it is, <laughs> be, be, because I don't, because I don't actually have to like, uh, I, I don't have to write the papers and, right. and take the criticism and show, and do yeah. like these rigorous studies and whatnot. It's kind yeah. of, and, uh, but your that situation for you is my people want to tell me a joke after the show. <laughs> and it's always under the guise of helping. It, it's usually, right. it usually I got goes, some new material for you. I got some new material for you. You're going to love this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and my favorite, th like the self, it's always one of my favorite setups. So sometimes it's just like that. Like people just, they're the funniest. They have new material for me. It's always just a street <laughs> joke that they read on the internet. They didn't come up with it on their own. Um, and then, but my favorite setup is someone will be like, people, people probably come up to you all the time and like try to tell you a joke, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of, kind of, it's annoying. And, you know, whatever. It comes with the job. And they're like, anyway, I got one for you. And like, <laughs> like, you were aware enough. To know that's a mistake that people make, and then still yeah. like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go right <laughs> into it. it. It's I, their lottery ticket, man. Uh, you know, they they just want they they just they know that they know they're not gonna win. And they're it's, not gonna win, but they gotta scratch the ticket, man. Because maybe you go like, <sighs> oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> like that. Thought of it. And yeah, that's had, such a great joke. I could just wow, go on the internet you. and read other people's horrendously racist jokes <laughs> and use those on on stage why why have i been killing myself over trying to write all these clever science jokes yeah no it's <laughs> tough i mean like, like you know like i say like our my version of it is somebody comes up and has a new idea and like there's no appreciation and i'm sure you know the stuff that we hear you do on stage, you've worked on probably sometimes for as long as five or 10 minutes, Shane, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, somebody has an idea and they're like, you know, I'm like, that's not a bad idea, actually. But like, come back to me in 10 years when you've done the experiments, you know? And like, in the meantime, let me tell you why I don't think it's going to work. Because yeah. I, I know the literature and I know what's been done. And here are the five things right off the bat that, that probably can, you know, challenge your idea. But hey, look, that's fine, but come back to me later, you know, workshop that a little bit and mm. uh, come back. So, um, uh, okay. Well, in, in this vein of, of, of what has, what's been a just so story and mm -hmm. what's been de debunked. I, I like to, one of my favorite things on this show is here's this moment where I share with you a thing that I learned in the past that is probably outdated science, mm -hmm. and I've been spreading horrible information all around to anyone that will listen because it's so interesting and such yeah. a fun story if it is actually true. Here it is. Um, uh, the the, um, th the, the um, bigger jawline in males being an honest indicator of fitness because testosterone this is along the lines of the handicap principles the testosterone probably uh, potentially being um hard on the immune system mm -hmm. and the immune system maybe during puberty only allowing for that amount of testosterone to be released that it feels the, uh, that the immune system is kind of able to uh, incur that cost on itself mm -hmm. and so it's it's this honest indicator um, much like the the peacock feathers that um, yes. that they had to have some decent genes or like a, at least like probably probably like a, a really good environment where there's been you know a, yeah. a secure food source or whatever this entire time and oh I love everything it. Else. it has all the elements it's it got all, all the elements, elements man yeah it's what like you... it's like you know 
it's got environment gene interaction happening. It's got uh, <laughs> developmental, you know, biology happening. It's it's just it's got enough nuance to be like, well, you know, not every situation, man. I'm not saying every situation, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh yeah, hey, you're really, into that's it. a really good one. You're uh, into it. Complete, <laughs> now, how would you how would you go testing such a thing? Well. Okay, so first of all, you'd have to ask yourself, what are jaw lines about, mm -hmm. right? Why do they grow differently in males versus females? You have to first establish that they do. But let's say, and I haven't, I don't do forensic osteology much. I used, I teach a little bit of it sometimes. I used to teach more of it. Um, and and is the that's, jaw that's line just that the inevitable income of of needing a face to go vertically down like this, and then needing a neck to come horizontally like this, and we're putting too much emphasis on these yeah. spandrels here, these corners of the, the, yeah, of the yeah, jaw. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's true that the, the, the mandible is a little bit slightly sexually amorphic. So if you, you know, if you know what you're doing and you, you know, I, hand, I hand you a mandible, you'll be able to say, oh, that's probably a male's versus a female's mandible. Mm -hmm. Same with a skull, same with uh, a pelvis is very dimorphic. And so it's true that there is some sexual dimorphism. That's what we, the term we use to describe you know, difference in shape or color or whatever between males and females of any species. So in humans, some of the bones are kind of sexually dimorphic and the jaw is one of them, slightly dimorphic, not, is okay, so there is. Um, and those dimorphic traits are partially influenced by males having more testosterone than females do. And so, yes, you're right so far. Now the question is, is it an honest signal that you have more testosterone, right? So it would have to be true that it would it, that having more testosterone would grow a bigger jawline, and that having more testosterone would also make you more likely to die somehow, and that having more testosterone would be good for your female partner who is looking is on is you know in this scenario is shopping for good genes, mm -hmm. um, and right. So you, you have to go one by one. I can tell you, like just the first one, the idea that having more testosterone means you have a bigger jawline, uh, that's, you're already with a problem there because it's not just how much testosterone's floating around. Testosterone's a hormone, and hormones are signals, and signals in your body only work when they hit a receptor that, that responds to that particular signal. Mm -hmm. And so you're not just talking about how much testosterone you have, you're also talking about um, how much uh, receptor density do you have on that tissue. And so two guys with exactly the same amount of testosterone they have very different jaw lines because this guy has more receptors and that guy has fewer, hmm. right? So like at step one of our five-step thing that you'd have to prove to me, I'm already suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of them, I don't know. But I love the story. I mean, shit, that's a uh, yeah. good story. I mean, if you're trying to convince me that things are just a little more nuanced and complicated than they appear, then I'm not having it. No, you should. Um, I, you should be, yeah. I, uh, be skeptical <laughs> of my skepticism. I, um, I, I, so, um, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I know this isn't uh, necessarily your site. I, I do have something a little more in line with the, your you study that I want to ask you about. But right. this is this is related. Um, here, here's the task I'm going to give you. Okay. You, you have. Um, the, a new dinosaur uh, skeleton <laughs> was just discovered, okay. and from uh, from its um, from its skeleton, you're going to try to infer its mating system, and you get either the skulls, male and female skulls, mm -hmm. to compare the dimorphism. Or you get the testicles uh, to body. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Uh, so I'll go skulls because for this one fact, reptiles don't have testicles the same way that you and I do. Uh, well, I don't know about you. The way that may that that, that, uh, that, <laughs> most that mammals men. do. The mammals yeah. do. Most mammals do. Um, because they have urogen they have like these like uh, so you know they don't even have any penises for that matter, right? They usually like have cloacas and so I'm not no. sure. Hmm. 
Hmm. You, you, you know how have you ever seen like the tattooed like lizard guy that put like the actual like horns in his head and tattooed his face green and like did the and like I missed split that his one. tongue and stuff and some people have I split can... their tongue to have like the lizard tongue yeah i did that with my testicles i have i have lizard testicles now. you've 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 merged them with your kidneys that's smart <laughs> yeah. that's smart yeah yeah uh i'll go skulls on that one but see okay so give, give me um See, I'd rather give me a primate example, right? We find that uh, two uh, a mummified primate, right? And would you or a whatever very very well fossilized primate? We, like we, we find we we find the the the, the skeleton for Bigfoot, right? We, we find Which is a, male it's only female a matter Bigfoot. Of time. It's only yeah. a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's want, UFOs now. I mean, first of all, uh, Bigfoot you know. gives you the opportunity to to test the long chain hypothesis that foot size tells you about penis length. I think that's <laughs> yeah. as a as a responsible scientist, I think that's what you do first. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but then, yeah, I want to know, like, why, why? See, so it's like this solitary creature, I think, right? So that's interesting because then you shouldn't have really big males mm. unless the males are territorial. So you have like a, an orangutan situation. Uh, right so yeah. <laughs> right right they are solitary well yeah i guess they are reported to be pretty I mean, solid they only I mean, we've only caught we only catch them walking alone we've never caught right. like a herd of them yeah it's not I mean, to say that be, they don't necessarily exist in herds and once in a while you just see one that's like got lost or something that's true there could be a, a nest of them somewhere <laughs> could a be den. A <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> they forage solitarily everybody knows that everybody knows that but they you know they're cooperative breeders too so it's like a whole thing <laughs> do we think that we've ever seen are there any sightings of bigfoot females uh <laughs> i mean i, no, I guess how like, would you know but it's, it's just one lone dude out there just scouring <laughs> the earth looking for another female yeah. Yeah, I mean we yeah. don't know how old this this Sasquatch is. Time's running out, I'm sure. <laughs> um all right. So here here's what I wanted to ask you regarding um uh evolution and kind of these efficient systems and and mm -hmm. meta uh, metabolism. What's your favorite primate and then also mammal in terms of i said sloth is my favorite in terms of like mm -hmm. these i i really think like mind-blowing efficiencies like cheetahs are insanely efficient for like sprinting and then like yeah. they pass out afterwards so it's like yeah. there's pros and cons um right yeah well i mean i'm gonna question. go i'm gonna I'm gonna cheat, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say orangutans are my favorite. Okay. And I'm cheating because we did this really cool study. You, know, you always love your first. You never forget your first, you know, your first love. And so the first time we measured uh, energy expenditures in a in an ape was this cool study we were able to do with orangutans. Mm. And we use this neat isotope tracking method where we can measure how much carbon dioxide the body makes. And that allows us to, to calculate how many calories, you know, these orangutans are burning every day. And we did it at this, uh, this uh, sort of zoo slash research facility in Iowa, um, which really cool place for like, it's all like almost like a sanctuary for orangutans, only they were happy to do research. Anyway, uh, and we, we just did this kind of, we actually wanted to measure chimpanzees or gorillas or something slightly more closely related to us, even though orangs are, are also pretty close. But we had the opportunity to do a range. We're like, ah, oh, what the heck? Sounds cool. Let's do it. And we didn't expect to find anything, you know, mind blowing. But then we did, which was we found out that orangutans uh, burn like only half the calories that humans do for, you know, the, for the same size, same activity level, all that stuff. Like their cells are just ticking along, tick, tick, tick so slowly. And if you, you know, talk about sloths, if you, so, so bigger things burn more calories because bigger mm -hmm. animals have more cells. And so, you know, an elephant will always burn more calories than an, a mouse. And so, um, but so if you're a biologist and you want to ask, is this animal burning a lot of calories or a little, it's almost like you have, you have to correct for body size. So it's like when you go to a doctor and you got a growth chart and you want to ask is, is, you know, is Billy tall or is Billy short? Well, it depends. 
Billy is five. So compared to other five-year-olds, Billy is right, five. right, right. So is this animal burning a lot of calories or not many? Well, it depends on how big the animal is. And, and for their size, sloths are burning fewer calories every day than just about any other mammal on the planet. The mm-hmm. the only other ones in their league are sorry, orangutans are burning fewer calories than any other animal animal on the planet. The only really? other species in their in their league are sloths and mm-hmm. pandas. Ooh. Boom. Those are like the three cutest things on earth too. If you can just get your calories down, you just turn very cute. I wonder where yeah. dogs, domesticated dogs fall on the that's cat. been done. They're, you know, they're they're like a typical mammal. There there's not a there's not a compelling metabolic story there. I bet I uh, bet they're more efficient than wolves just based on cuteness alone. If I'm if if I'm correctly <laughs> If I'm correctly putting together and forgetting the correlation and causation, lessons you're telling a great story. Already learned. Shane, you, you put it together, right? Yeah. See, this is I, it. This is how it happens. <laughs> and either you're a genius or you're just another guy telling stories. You know, we Which, don't know. By the way, it's my understanding that the Einstein story. Do you know that it was like, it, you know, he was a patent clerk, and it was mm-hmm. it was that people kept on coming in. They were trying to patent the idea of ether. Why? Why, if you have gravity, why aren't things, why is there a universe? Why isn't everything collapsed in on itself? Right. There must be this imaginary force called ether. So they kept on coming in and it's Einstein's job to like award a patent to whoever like had the right ether idea. And he kept on being like, wait, what is ether? Like, <laughs> wait, explain it to me again. And then like, yeah. you'd have to like work out the, and being like, what? But I can't. I can't stamp the approval on this until I can like actually make sense of this, of this I love thing. It. I love and it. I, no, I haven't you... heard that story. That reminds me of, um, so I, I just finished writing a book on metabolism, by the way. Oh, when's it and, come out? Um, it's it's going to come out in maybe by Christmas, but maybe in the winter 2021. It'll well, I was going to say I'd hold on enough. to this, but I'll just have you back on when it, when it comes out. I'll read the book. We'll do a whole book club. That'd be fantastic. Uh, and so, but yeah, I was reading up on the history of met- metabolic research uh, the other day. Mm-hmm. And there's this wonderful history um, of this stuff called phlogiston. Ever heard of phlogiston before? No. Phlogiston is what people in the, like around the Enlightenment, around the turn of, uh, you know, 16th, 17th century, uh, people were trying to figure out like, okay, well, what is fire? Everybody's got fire. What is fire? And, you know, and not only that, but fire is warm and, and living things are warm. And are, is, is fire happening in us? Like, and, and if so, like, what is that? Like, how does that work? And, and what are the connections? And, and so like fundamentally they had to figure out what the hell is happening. <laughs> stuff burns. Right. And that's really hard to do. Really hard to do. Yeah. And so, um, what they decided it was, they decided that phlogiston is this stuff, this, you know, a little blurry on the details, but it's this stuff that's inside of stuff that will burn. Um, so it's not inside of metal, because metal doesn't burn, but it's inside of wood, and it's inside of your food, and anything that you can light on fire has phlogiston in it. Mm. And when you burn it, something, it releases the phlogiston. <laughs> and... Um, and if you, and this is why, I mean, duh, this is why if you put a candle under a bell jar, eventually the candle goes out because you fill that air, so they fill that space with phlogiston. There's no more room for it. Mm. And now there's no place for the phlogiston to go and the candle goes out. See? That's amazing. That's such a good story that I'm going to have, next time I need a screen name for something, it's going to be phlogiston. Just yeah to make people ask me about it. It's like the, it's like the infinite toilet paper roll trick. <laughs> you set yourself yeah. up to be really interesting. But it, Screen it, it, nine vlogist on. It gets even better because it took, it's really obvious that stuff is given off when something burns, right? It's not at all obvious that anything's consumed out of mm-hmm. the air, right? And, and, to, and to even to think about the idea that something's consumed out of the air, you had to have this idea ahead of time. Like you needed this first idea that you didn't even know you were missing, that air isn't all one thing, right? They didn't mm. know that air was nitrogen and oxygen and some other stuff right, mixed right. together. They didn't know they thought air was air. 
I mean, water is water. So air is air, right? Yeah. Uh, and they had to discover oxygen, and then they had to discover um, that you could take the oxygen out of the air, and then stuff wouldn't burn. And like, man, and I and like all of this stuff was done with equipment that is less complicated than what you have in your kitchen right now. Mm. And they fucking figured out oxygen, and I mean that's that's that blows my mind. It, okay, now it took them two hundred years. So yeah. They, <laughs> It's not like they did Still, it, in a week. it is pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I have a. I almost asked this in a Twitter poll recently. Do you take all books? Um. Uh, so you, we're we're going to lose all of the books on one half of history. You take all the books after Darwin, or all the books before. And we're like, re do we get to remember the things that we read, or, or that? I think you uh, can figure things out race. again. Like, uh, there's a new society. We're giving them all half of those books. Well, what are what, oh, what are they going to? Okay, we're gonna. We got two islands of people um, that are their clones or something. They're exa everything, but they're the totally exact naive same. to everything except for whatever they're they totally have in those naive, books. Whatever they have in those books. Who who builds a? Um, more knowledgeable society because then does yeah. more knowledge make a society better uh yet to be determined we'll see how the singularity goes um, yeah right but like where would you want your kids to grow up yeah where or, would you, you know where, where would you want to grow? place your bets on who I, blows up first i i ask because i i think that um you, you know i was never that into philosophy like a classic uh, like i I love uh, having philosophical conversations, but but like studying Plato or whatever, just because it just seemed like such huge knowledge gaps that I, I'm always just like, yeah, but where are we now with this level of thinking? Like, I only yeah. have, life's short, I only have so many books <laughs> that I can that I can read. And it always yeah. just, so I was taking some, I took this great class, I've uh, this great courses uh, plus is this uh, this online course thing that sometimes sponsors the show. Uh, great courses plus slash here we are. Get your free trial today. But I was taking a great course on um, existentialism and it was a history of philosophy, all these things. And I was like, man, so many of these philosophers, if if you would have gave them the book Origin of Species. They would have taken a big black marker to half of the shit that they said, and they're like, "Oh, I got to rewrite." Um, yeah. A, yeah, a lot of that stuff. So I, I don't know. I just no. There's a great. I, there's a um, there's a great quote. I think is it Darwin's quote or is it Huxley's quote, where he says, "You know, uh, you know, the world would do a whole lot." more towards met the metaphysics of by, by of met towards metaphysics by studying baboons mm -hmm. than by you know navel gazing i'm paraphrasing right. but it's something right, like right, that right right and uh yeah that's exactly it mm. i I'm, I'm still stuck on this wonderful question this wonderful thought experiment do you take the the knowledge before darwin or after and in a way, it's a false. I mean, of course, it's it's a ridiculous question, but it's a ridiculous question in some ways because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna read how all about dare you call stuff. a comedian ridiculous? <laughs> you're gonna read all about the old stuff in the new books, right? But somehow you can yeah, like erase all true. the references to that. Yeah. So all you really got was the new stuff. Mm, and right, then I want the right, old stuff. Right. And I want the old stuff. If if you and can, if like stuff. somehow you know it's erased out of there. Mm, okay. Um, Interesting. Although you sort of like, it, it's in, it, you know, in a lot of ways, my students recreate that experiment every semester by like completely ignoring anything that didn't happen, you know, in the last two years and isn't readily available on Google Scholar. So like, you know, we, I run that experiment yeah. every year and it doesn't turn out great. I got to tell you, you wouldn't yeah. want to base a society on most of those great papers. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, interesting. Well, as um, uh, be, before we, um, as we're wrapping up, uh, do yeah. you have any, um, was there anything that your kind of particular lens, um, has, has had you thinking about, um, with this, uh, with this current, um, shift? I, I do, I do believe that this is 
this is going to be somewhat of a punctuated equilibrium for people in, in terms of, uh, you know, rather, rather than things changing slowly over time, it, it is mm -hmm. for, for better or worse, there's going to be many aspects of our culture, of our individual takes on things, of our points of view, just so many things are going to be, e e even if there was a cure today, yeah. And we all just went back to business as usual. I think that there would be some pretty interesting changes that would, e even just in terms of like, um, yeah, like you mentioned, like, oh, we can just remote, the, you know, go and get a professor in, in Africa right now to, to give a little talk yeah. for our, our class. Yeah, you know, I, so I've, I have resisted the temptation to weigh in on the epidemiology of what's happening with COVID-19, you know, because I, of course I have my opinions and my thoughts, but I'm trying to be good about it and not, and not, uh, not pretend I know what I don't. But here's mm -hmm. what I do, I, I do feel confident saying as an evolutionary anthropologist, um, is that, you know, watching our society try to, you know, ignore these sort of in instincts to be social, and to share and to, and to live in a group and to, to see everybody and, I mean, especially just like to share food, right? There's no more human adaptation uh, to, than to share food. And like, that's, that's the worst thing to do right now. <laughs> you, should, yeah. you should not be sharing stuff that you put in your mouth. Yeah. Unless you go to restaurants and you should, you should support your local restaurants and get takeout and all that. That's wonderful. But, you know, there's a reason that we're not, you know, crammed into New York uh, you know, little Italy restaurants right now, shoulder to shoulder and like touching each other's plates. Mm -hmm. But that's so hard for us. It's like so, so hard. Um, and I think that's what's going to eventually lead us to crack. It won't be what eventually gets us to crack won't be um, the good news about the pandemic because I don't think anybody who's paying attention to the numbers sees a whole lot of good news right now or, <laughs> or good news that wouldn't vanish if we stopped doing what we're doing. Um, it, I don't even think it'll be the economic stuff. The economic stuff is painful and, you know, God, you just feel so terrible for people who have lost livelihoods and, and businesses are gone. And, but even that, I think people would, would ignore it or would, you know, as long as it's not happening to them, they'd say, oh, well, that's too bad, but I can get on with it. What is going to make people crack is our inability to not be social. Mm. And, you know, we, that's because that's 2 million years, man, or, or more of just of, of evolving this brain that needs to be with people. Mm -hmm. We need it. We just, you know, and it hurts us psychologically and emotionally and, you know, to, to not be with, with our network, man. And uh, it's just so hard. You know, we're like everybody who I've read, who I res you know, seems to know what they're talking about, from Anthony Fauci to the rest of the people who really seem to have a, a handle on the epidemiology, are saying this is a years-long thing. This isn't yeah. a month. This isn't a week's long. This is a years-long thing. Guys, we're, up, we're at week seven here in North Carolina, and already people are like, I can't handle it. I'm out. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I, did, I did just have someone on kind of talking about uh, small incremental gains, you know, and, and mm -hmm. then, and then in the, in the same day, I had just happened to watch, um, a fantastic little video from a mathematician about like in, in an ideal scenario of, of kind of expanding the, like at first you expand the essential workers and then you go like, mm -hmm. okay, now we have little bits of service industry for the essential workers, for their mental health, and, and, and it's slow enough and small enough to take precautions. But it did, it did seem interesting, the idea of like having these small steps toward it, it, uh, as kind of being yeah. better than like, let's all try to get back to normal, and then it collapses again, and then we need to go back to this, and then right. you do that so many times, and I think people are going to learn helplessness. Um, yeah, for sure. But but whereas, whereas this is still like, I think people are still in a little bit of a free fall of the rug being pulled up from under. Like I yeah, I want people to know like, this is going to be a year. And like <laughs> the sooner we accept it, like I just I just yeah. went on like a little bender last weekend of like I I knew I had to cancel my May dates for like months now. 
but I just sure. hadn't because I didn't feel like it didn't matter anyway. I wasn't like putting money into advertising. And it was like, who knows if there's a miracle? And, and but I knew they were going to be canceled. But I, I was start I was thinking about booking like mid August. And yeah. at the same time of canceling it's it's occurred to me that stand up comedy is going to be the last thing to come back. That's that's gonna that's gonna come back after there's a mm. vaccine. That's minimum a year, I would think. And it's just but but much in the same way that that with the good things going uh, going slowly and the small incremental gains being better than like winning the lottery and then never hitting that um, that right. high again. Bad right. things are just the opposite. Where you want to be like as as awful as the paralyzed person uh, being paralyzed um seems paralyzed people acclimate uh to that in like <laughs> right. in, in like a year right. c- c- compared to no one wants to be paralyzed and, and, and uh, obviously but compared to the small uh incremental drops of like ms or als or something like that that's absolutely yeah. brutal for people i almost feel like we need to just be like everybody just fucking accept this like as much as you can right now yeah take all the pain bottom out hit fucking rock bottom right now whatever you have to do and then yeah. let's like slowly start digging uh, out out from there I, I i don't know i i have yeah. no idea how to this is this is just way too big of a huge dynamic chaotic system of of a zillion different variables and us having never experienced anything like this in our lifetimes, not to mention humans have never experienced anything where one understanding why we had to isolate, even if we Mm -hmm. stumbled upon isolating and two being able to virtually connect, but not physically connect. It's just such a bizarre thing that uh, the species has never yeah, I, I, so, you know, I think the other part of it for me, you know, trying to put on my evolutionary anthropology hat here and think about it. One is that, like, you know, pe- plagues have been happening since we decided to all live in close quarters together and farm, right? Mm-hmm. So plagues are about 12,000 years old. And if you look even just through European history, like the Black Death and all that stuff, like the, there's all sorts of horrible stories there. But it's not just European history, of course, it's, it's worldwide. And it's because you know, we didn't evolve this way and we started living in these, these close quarters and we just gave, we gave these bugs like the best possible scenario. This is like, this is their dream come true, right? They can just, now they hop around and now with the globally connected world is even worse because you don't just have uh, a plague on, in one area, you've got it across the globe. Um, and then at the same time, as you say, we can watch people who seem to be okay. I mean, you know, and, and connect across. And so I think, it, it really challenges our abilities, uh, which are limited, because they were never evolved to do complex math like this, to understand small problems over large time scales and large geographic scales. Mm-hmm. We, have, we can do, we can respond to 9-11, because it's a big, horrible thing that happens right now, and it's over by nine in the morning, mm-hmm. right? And we did not respond to that particularly well, necessarily not arguing that, but we can comprehend it. It was horrible. And we're going to do this stuff about it. And everybody can agree that those big buildings falling down was a, was a tragedy and we should never let that happen again. Yeah. The drip, 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 uh, by the way, 9-11, as you know, killed about 3,000 people. Yeah. The drip, drip, drip to get to 50,000 deaths. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, in four weeks of, of having, you know. Directly related to COVID, not to mention all of know, the exactly. people with the fucking uh, uh, yeah. problem with your gallbladder or whatever that you're oh, not yeah. going in for. Yeah. And the fact that, like, actually, like, the, you know, if we social distance and we fixed the, the spread rate by, like, 5%, that probably stopped another Tens of thousands of people, but you, but people have a really hard time with that, right? Because you're like, well, the death rates, oh, whatever, the death rates, you know, one percent. That doesn't sound so bad. I I, like I, I love people, you know. Oh I love, my god, I love people just just uh, try uh, trying to fuck around with stats for the first time in their lives. <laughs> yeah, <too>. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You're like, well, what would one percent of the U.S. population be? <laughs> Three million people. You 
you know, the, ah. <laughs> so, you know, but it's just, we, our brains are not built for that, man. We, we take no. the big catastrophe. We can actually wrap our heads around it. Well, plus, we cannot wrap our heads around the drip, drip, drip. Well, r- right, or, right or wrong, you could put a face or like a visible enemy on on nine eleven. Yeah, right. you know, like and 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 we we trust our eyeballs. Um, yeah. a, a lot more than uh, than whatever ability to use these tools to detect a thing that we can't uh, exactly. see. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. It's going to get crazy. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, who knows? But I, um, I, I think that, uh, that this is, uh, yeah, I don't, I am not, this is, it, this is, as you're talking about the, the, the bigger and kind of smaller idea, it is funny to me too, that, has there ever been such a difference in like our view of day-to-day life and our view of these huge existential <laughs> ideas of like, so anyone you talk to is just like, how are you doing? Well, all good considering, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but like considering is horrifying. <laughs> I try yeah. not to kid her. I try not to consider too much and just like, keep focused on my gardening yeah yeah no that's right man it's, you know it's uh and yeah at the same time like when we finally get there when we finally get on the other side of this it'll happen eventually i mean yeah. the spanish flu took about three years and finally blew itself out with basically no intervention they didn't have yeah yeah um so but three years is a damn long time but let's say it takes three years you know in three years and a month We'll all be back to the same dumb shit that we we're doing before. Yeah, It'll be quick. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, my. Yeah. I mean, I hope you're right that I remember to zoom my colleagues in from around the globe yeah. when this is all done, and I remember to be thankful that you know I can go to a restaurant, and I hope I can hold on to that. But God, we're so, you know, I, I've, I've been just kind of you know ruminating on this, just like how how close our horizons really are in terms of where we, we can exp- understand and experience and project. And like, as that little window of time gets moved down, like what happened three weeks ago, we don't even remember anymore. And, you know, it's like, we want to believe, Oh, I'm, I'm, it's like the classic, it's the classic, you know, you have this mind, this life changing event, it, you know, and you're going to remember this. You're going to be grateful from now on because no, you won't. Yeah, you go back right to all the same shit. I, I mean, cr- uh, I hope f- not. fingers crossed. There's going to be fingers crossed um, that culture will remember some of the good things that come of this yeah. and forget some of the bad th- things. Well, yeah, and, and we you know, this, that's actually one of the, the one of the hopes of a of a culture that can keep records, right? Is that we we do we keep the records and we we realize we, we have somebody in charge of remembering yeah, how yeah. fucking bad it was. Uh, yeah. And that person is given, you know, the ability to like have a, a warehouse full of masks. <laughs> and and yeah. like, you know, like we, cause we can, we can do better than that. I don't think the average person day to day life is going to, is going to change because I think we'll just revert like to that lowest energy, you know, like, Oh, we're back in our little divot again. And we're, we're comfortable here. But we do have the possibility to have a culture that's smarter after this. And let's, you know, who knows? Yeah. I, I, who, let's hope so. I, I mean, this is, uh, well, like, like St- Steven Pinker did put out, a, a, have like awkward timing to put out a book about how this is the safest time in human history. <laughs> um, but, but, but it is like, there, there were tons of, uh, for, for not being a, a, a perfect piece of, of work, and I've I've seen you know other other people giving them some criticism, blowback from it. They made a lot of good points about like, uh, yeah. and, and 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 being a big fan of Robert Sapolsky and and understanding the huge burden of chronic stress. Um, I I do hope that not everyone 
is a germaphobe af- after this. Uh, right, and, and, right. And, and we have appropriate, like, we compartmentalize. Now we know that we need to have stuff stored away and, and ready to go for when shit does hit the fan. And then the day-to-day, we, we don't need to be, like, er, not yeah. everyone on Earth needs to be OCD. And that, so I hope we'll forget, like, some of those negative habits that we might build. And then I hope that we'll, that this will be a chance to be like, you know, we should have had automatic bathroom doors in public restrooms this entire time. There should have always right. been a little handicap button uh, th- th- on the floor that you that you press, and then the door o- <laughs> opens for you, or or whatever things people are going to start putting yep. in. Should have always been the case, and this is the chance to change that and see it differently. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so hopefully those will be the uh, the 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 way things go. But um, I'm. I'm, uh, it's, it's fun when I get to hear, talk to someone, uh, with a cynical point of view, because then it pulls out (laughs) my, my contrarian makes me pull out the rare moments of my optimism, uh, that I'm glad I could help. So I'm glad I could help. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't spend a career studying things that went extinct and, uh, and go home very optimistic at the end of the day. Uh, well, look, look at the, the the positive reframing of all of this is we might have got to us, you and me, we might have got to experience human peak capacity. We might have actually <laughs> seen, we might have yeah. seen the top, we might have got the yeah. top of Everest. Uh, no, that's right. The yeah, it's like watching the Stones play Madison Square Garden or something like that. You know, you're like, Wait, I was there when it all happened. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and let's get you back on. Uh, j- just because I'm not going to remember the exact dates and everything, if mm-hmm. you happen to remember to reach back out to me, I would love to get you on to chat about the book. Um, That'd be great. I'd love that. And uh, send me an advanced copy and and stuff like that. And I'm really looking forward to it. Sure, man. Such a fantastic conversation. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Thanks for the invitation. And um, yeah, take care. We'll catch you later. Thanks for enjoying the show. We are, are continuing, much like making the animation of the theme song, we're continuing to make more and more improvements as time goes on. And this is all building toward getting to add video after quarantine when I'm once again interviewing all of my academics in person, going from university to university. I want you guys to see the campus, the labs that I'm touring, the offices that the academics are in. When I, uh, when I actually get to participate uh, in, in a study, it's going to really set this apart from any other podcast out there. Sure, there's a lot of fancy-looking podcasts with slightly uh, better corners of a room that they set up to make their production quality uh, look a little better. But this is just, uh, uh, this is um, us just building toward something special unlike anything anyone else is doing out there. I have about one year to figure out all of the editing and equipment and everything else that I'll need. And to get enough people watching this new YouTube channel to make it worth the uh, time, effort, and money to invest in that. So thanks for supporting on Patreon and uh, enjoy the show. Uh, I hope to see what I mean to say is sometimes I hit stop and then record and then other times I just show you guys, uh, say, hey, sometimes I'm just a human being um saying the wrong thing at the end of an episode not quite sure how to end it but might i direct you to your favorite podcast episode uh, app to uh watch the first time herman poncer was on the show there i did it got it all out that was the information we fumbled our way through it i hope you fumble your way back here for the next episode. Have a great week.